Yeah, Mr. Lindugut, just test your mic for me. Happen to just check your mic, just test your mic for me there. Lindo. I'll just give five minutes. Um, the other speaker, Chris, said that he'll be joining shortly. Greetings, Chairman. Greetings, my brother. How are you, Mr. Antum? Hey, man, I can't complain. You can't complain. Yeah. Are you you're not a United fan? I'm a citizen. You're a citizen. Uh, the, so, yeah. so, okay. yeah. Yeah. How do I just waiting for Chris and I said he's connecting uh, shortly? No problem. All right. You will uh, oh. forgive me. I'm not. Uh, uh, I could, could like. <laughs> <laughs> Even myself, it's actually I was busy with something, so putting for formal. I was just on my way back from there now. No, oh, no, that's good. That that makes me feel better. <laughs> I'm curious while waiting for uh, Chris why, why did you choose a public platform Mr. Linda uh, for, for the discussion yeah I mean, I, I think it's a conversation we need to have as young people, yeah. honestly and, and, and genuinely. Yeah. Um, so I, I believe we we need to talk to each and every young person we can get to. So I think a public platform allows us to have a, a, a wider reach in terms of yeah. getting the message out to there to say as young people, we must realize and wake up and realize that we're on our own. Uh, yeah. No one is coming to save us. Uh, yeah. So I think that's why. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, 
on your side, what made you think we should have that discussion? So um, I'm, I'm launching a mini series called Chairman Conversations. And oh, yeah. So it's more like what Mark G is doing or? Yeah, it's something like what, uh, yeah, it's cause I'm, it's on YouTube. I'm gonna load the video on YouTube as well. So it's similar to what Mick G is, is doing, um, but it's because largely I have these conversations a lot with a lot of people. It's not uncommon that after I talk to you, somebody can give me a call and say, uh, what do you think about the issues that you mentioned there? Yes. You know? Yeah. And I think uh, for the longest time, I've just um, put on my business hat and decided that, you know, I'm not going to engage politics, especially. And then socioeconomic issues here and there, to the extent that I've got a direct link or control or, hey. And that's another you know, thing I like, and I, I, I'm glad we are beginning to talk about, you know. Yeah, I think as many people, we we have this thing of saying, ah, politics is not for me. Ah, politics is dirty, and I don't want to be in politics. But one way or another, politics decides your life. And and I think this load shedding and current state of the country has yeah. made us realize that uh, <laughs> one way or another, politics is in our lives. And um, yeah. The, the, the best way to protect ourselves is for us to be directly involved and directly uh, contributing to the political space. Yeah. I think it's gonna be interesting for me if you can direct me how that can happen because I can tell you now uh, with the number of people hopefully that can join and that are interested in this topic some of our despondency comes from the fact that we just feel as if it's way out of our reach, you know? Yeah. No, that, that's very much true. And it has led to a lot of people not understanding how they can participate in the political space. And it ends up being a post of a young person who was saying, uh, we we are the generation that doesn't even know who the councillor is, where we live, how the councillor won. Um, oh, it's, it's my it's my it's my status as I was promoting this conversation. Yes, yes. So, yeah. um, I think because we we leave that space to say I into Zaboli into whereas at the end of the day, the, the mess that Lindo creates implicates you directly. Yeah, in, in that you, you now don't have power at all. Yeah. And you'd be surprised yeah. how South Africa can be stranded for coal when we are powering Europe with our coal. But yeah. uh, for, for some odd reason, we don't have enough coal for, for, for ourselves. Yeah. It's the most shocking of things that you, you just wouldn't understand. Yeah. yeah. But it's important That's for all of us to be involved in the political space. And it yeah. begins with a simple branch. Uh, yeah. the, any political party um, like the NC has got a branch which exists in a ward. So we are demarcated yeah. according to wards. Like where I am is ward 96. Um, in that ward, there would be a branch of the ANC that you would have to join. So you, you, you complete a membership form, which is now online in the ANC, makes every, everyone's life easy. Or yeah. you go and join a, a structure of the ANC with leak or whichever part you may choose. But um, my, my, my priority is the ANC. So then you become actively involved as you start getting to understand how the ward operates. You will be able to raise issues affecting you where you'd stay or the section where you stay, be it crime. Uh, it allows you to connect also to the community police forum uh, yeah. to know who, who your councillor is. And when, when, when the elections are happening, you decide whether you want to campaign for them and support them and invest your time. So, yeah. I think that's that's a basic start. I would say for any young person that wants to be involved politically, 
they would have to identify firstly the what in which they exist in and in yeah. that what go and look for the branch of the political party that they, they are interested in uh, hopefully it will be the african national congress and then they would um, become members of the branch and go into branch general meetings and annual general meetings and get to hear the report of the councillor, the report of the chairperson of the branch, the report of the treasurer, uh, how much has been raised, how much has been uh, spent on what. All of yeah. those things, it, it, it helps you sort of get an idea of what's happening. If there's supposed to be a national conference, you must go and elect a delegate, all those type of things. And young people must be actively involved and make sure they become delegates to, 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 to the national conference of these big political parties so that they, they can be able to advance interests of youth and protect themselves from a generation of old people that is feeling entitled to power because they have held on to it for a long time or because they, they've rescued us from, from, from a cruel apartheid government. Yeah. I mean, I actually, Chris, I see it seems like you're in. Have you sorted out your audio issues? I am. I am. Firstly, uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. I apologize. I was experiencing some issues due to load shedding. Um, it should return at about half past. So as it is, uh, my network isn't allowing me to uh, video interact with you, but um, I can speak. No, not a problem at all. Um, Lindo was just being very opportunistic there to launch the manifesto to the early bed so that he doesn't miss the opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> and he doesn't know that. I, I witnessed it, I, I understand. The, and I'm gonna give him an opportunity to share screen and go on the ANC website and show us the application form and everything. We, we, we're, not, we're not gonna leave it to chance today because uh, we don't want a situation where we discuss it in theory, but in practice, the application form is hidden under some video or song that you must first listen to and then you know the youth gives up i think with that let me introduce um, chris and lindo uh, to everybody else that's joining us i think feel free to ask questions or engage in the chat um i'll try and center the conversation around the three of us um, with you guys essentially being the proverbial uh, fly on the wall, just so that we can have a bit of structure. It is an informal chat. Um, I saw Lindo's status and I reacted as well, very opportuni opportunistically to say, you know, let's have a conversation about this thing. And um, being the gentleman that he is um, and how he's uh, pos um, positioned in the movement and in these youth, engagement he said actually make it a public link so that we can have um, the conversation with a bit of an audience so there'll be an element of us you know having our conversation uh, but we also would not like to completely ignore you the chat uh, box is available and then we'll make we'll occasionally uh, jump in there and engage right uh, the views that are going to be expressed here are completely our own. Uh, we, we are affiliated to a lot of things, but we in no way trying to represent their views unless we expressly say so that, you know what, for example, now my company, here and there I can say this is a view that uh, finance had or thousand thousands holds and then we'll stand behind it. But if we say anything untoward, uh, I, I remember one president said it's locker room chat um this is the this is shack conversations or on the road conversations he's the chairperson of the greater deep Sloot united for a better future ngo which is focused on education and health he's also the chairperson of the anc youth league ward 96 and the chairperson of the pongola debating league he's a former men's halls uh, men's hall of residence uh Vets chairperson, former men's halls of residence vets vice chairperson, as well as the all residents council and students representative council member. He's a lawyer by trade. Um, I think I've worked on one deal with him, 
but occasionally a mining deal and occasionally we bump into each other through common networks, uh, professional networks that we do share. Uh, as maybe those of you would have caught on early, uh, he's very passionate about the movement, especially as far as it gives him an agency or, or, or a platform through which he has the desired impact. He is very active uh, and very proud. And one of the few young people that uh, personally I look up to in that uh, regard, you know, it's one thing to be unhappy with politics. It's one th another thing to wash it and hand it over to other people. You'll wake up 50 and feel as if you don't have any power, not realizing that your peers were still engaging um, back when you were complaining. If I can go to Chris, uh, it says here a short bio, but uh, grab a glass of water because it's anything but short. Impressive at least, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, Christopher W. Mpethe is a finance professional, academic, and entrepreneur. He is currently working as a financial manager in the healthcare sector and serving as the founder and CEO of Mpethe Capital. He is a CFA candidate and holds a Master of International Business from Monash University, uh, Australia, Clayton Campus School of Business and Economics. He also holds an honors in political science from VETS, as well as a bachelor's degree in psychology and international studies. He's a former chairperson of the VETS Postgraduate Association, member of council and SRC postgraduate representative. Politically, he's a member of the African National Congress in good standing, let it be said. He pays his membership fees, he attends the required meetings, as well as its youth league. And has, served, and has served in a number of roles over the years. Most recently as chairperson of the ANC Youth uh, League in Ward 73. So we've got Ward 73 and 96 represented of Greater Johannesburg Region, as well as a member of the Branch Executive Committee. He's passionate about uh, youth empowerment. Uh, I'm not sure if you want me to read my bio. I think for consistency, I'll read it, but just bear with me. I have to look it up. I wasn't prepared to read it, even though I'm, I'm the host. Uh, there we go. I actually should be saying who I am. You know, first and foremost, is a very proud African and a member of his family. He actually identifies with the people of Limpopo quite, quite well. He's half Zulu, half Pedi. Also a venture capitalist with a deep history in auditing and the public sector uh, and advising numerous entities outside of it. He has dealt with varying cross-border transactions such as with businesses based in the States, Kenya, Russia, you name it. Most notably, Lisekhsha was elected as one of the co-authors of the Africa 80 project, an, in an initiative that gives young Africans an opportunity to provide the solutions that will shape Africa's growth path in various fields. To this end, Lisekhsha wrote chapter 10 on investment, finance, and aid. He's the co-founder of Thousand Thousand Capital, an investment club that seeks to mobilize a thousand young professionals to invest in establishing the township as a market ripe for investment. In addition, he serves on the board of trustees for Devon Park Body Corporate, and the advisory board of Athlima Tech. He has more than 10 years now JSC investing experience and is a proponent of the value investment philosophy. Then daughter holds a bachelor of commerce in accounting as well as from the University of Pretoria as well as an honors in accounting from Monash University. At least that gets those dignitaries out the way. Then I turned actually, then I can even read those. Uh, you know, as I stated, I'm very uh, passionate about this continent and its issues. I think I'll go straight into it as you were, uh, Mr. Ndumba, by reading your status as you had posted it. As all of you can see there, he said he slept, he slept very angry last night, the night before, 
about a lot of things currently happening politically in this country. Interest rate hikes, which have massaged him uh, on his very own bond. Load shedding, as you heard Mr. Christopher there, it's currently dealing with him and hence we can't even see him. Um, he also mentions unemployment, which actually affects his very family. And I'm sure a lot of us can resonate with that. He states further that big business is not doing well because of load shading and transnet. Small business is hanging by a thread and, the, and most of them are shutting down, including the consumers of four ways germophobes. In other words, if you go to four ways, uh, there are small businesses there that are trying you know, to sell even to their market. No, and this intends for us to look up is my, is my fumigation business. Yeah. So you'd find um, the people who would call me to come and sanitize or fumigate their offices are uh, now shutting down. And most of the people who make cakes unable to sustain their businesses is painful because they, they yeah. it requires a, a certain temperature and they can't sustain it with load shedding, which damages their business and they have to go out of business. Yeah. He further states there that general work efficiency has reduced, then you can't get things you want in time. And then he says, hey, Kuning man, even those who owe us are struggling. You know. Uh, I think I want to start there. You know, the number of items that you've uh, mentioned on here, it's the same grocery list that the rest of us um, have. And I wanted perhaps, I'm just gonna give you five minutes on that one, Mr. Lindo. Perhaps balance the gap that us as the youth perhaps would feel that government is letting us down. I don't even think the youth, I think the entire country. And for us, government is synonymous to the ANC. It's not, uh, it's not uh, divorced from the ANC as far as we are concerned. What even fewer would know is that the minute you say government, you're talking about every party represented in parliament. So it's the EFF, it's the DA, and the ANC being the majority. The entire cohort is actually failing us uh, when we say government is failing us. But as the chairperson of the ANC Youth League, perhaps you can reconcile for me, how is it that you are crying on the same platform that we are crying on? What do we miss? What don't we understand about this affiliation to the ANC as well as you being a citizen? Mr. Lindo. Is it me or is this network frozen? Yeah, it, it seems as if he, he may be experiencing some issues. Happy to have you take it, Mr. Christoph, as the former, <laughs> former role that he's currently serving in. The, the question goes both ways. Mm. Yes, yeah, I was. I was dreading it as I as as I heard it. I was I was trying to dodge it, <laughs> but um, okay. I think, look, as as young people, um, what I'll say, what I'll begin by saying is that I think before I am an, a member of the ANC, I'm an, a citizen of this country. Um, the ANC is simply a, a tool through which I conduct my activism, but I am an activist by um, uh, by, by nature. And so um, reconciling being an ANC member and trying to reconcile the challenges that we face with ANC as well as government, um, you must have the, the, I think the maturity to separate your, your own personal um, attachment and belief in the movement with what needs to be done for the, the country. Um, one of the things that we, we encourage within the organization is that we, the, the, the ANC, does, being a member of the ANC does not mean that you can't criticize it, particularly as a young person. In fact, it is our responsibility as young people in the ANC to present the ANC and challenge it with ideas, to present it with solutions uh, to problems and uh, to try and, and, and essentially um, express the views of young people in the country who, who don't, are not necessarily ANC members, but to conscientize the movement as to what is going on on the ground. Um, so 
um, to essentially answer your question, um, it is a, a challenge for us um, watching the ANC and to uh, admittedly have some uh, grievances with it, um, grievances with it in government and, 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 and issues of that nature. But gone are the days when we as young people are, are going to just sit around and uh, not be vocal about our grievances because ultimately um, we are trying to save the country. So um, I think that, yeah, I think it's time now for us to, to basically stand up and say that, yes, we are ANC members, um, but we're citizens first. And so uh, this is not on. You, you raise a very important point uh, when you mentioned separate, the, being separate from the ANC, you know, being a citizen first, because I think as the generation or the generations before us, um, as they would resonate with the ANC, I don't think, you know, especially many of them are not members of the ANC. I think it's quite famous that the ANC has about a million members, a million, uh, I think you mentioned in your bio, uh, members in right standing and everybody else is a supporter of the ANC. But, you know, when you listen to South Africans speak about the ANC, they are speaking about their party, you know? Um, and I think perhaps maybe you can even elaborate further on this issue of being a citizen before you are a member of the ANC or before, yeah, you're a member of the ANC. Is it something along the lines of, for example, most of us here we are employed where we happily draw a line between ourselves and our employer. We get home and our struggles there, we put them on government. We don't put them on my employer who is not paying me enough or my employer who's not stimulating me enough. Are you saying that we have reached a point in our democracy where it's safe for people not to see themselves as the ANC and to see the ANC as another product on the shelf that they may choose to consume or not consume? Mm. Uh, well, I believe that, that that would be, that should be the case in the sense that that would be a sign of political maturity. Um, of okay. course, we're a young democracy. So um, yeah. I think the, the African National Congress is very idealized um, okay. because of the past, because of uh, what has been, what, you know, all of the, the good things that it did in the past and, and so on. But um, I think the members of the ANC today are not the members of old. And yeah. we have to come, we have to reconcile the fact that um, these are people, these are individuals. And so, um, when you when you choose to join, be it the ANC or any other organization, and you have to go into it understanding that um, this that you're dealing with people. Some of the people will be good. Some people are here for the wrong reasons. Some people, you know, they're they're, they're different kinds of people. So it's it's not um, you know it's not some magical mythical thing that will work out and just be right. You need the right people in there. You need the right um, ideas the, and, and the right intentions behind it. And so I would agree with you in the sense that um, I, we, we have reached a point where people must choose whether or not they want to consume it. But I'll also add on and say that I believe that that would be good for the ANC um, because being in a state of one party dominance for so long, um, it's easy for you to um, just, just coast and feel like um, no matter what we do, we're going to win. And this, the, the lack of competition, um, as you would know, similarly in business, competition makes you perform. It makes you, uh, you know, it, 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 it can, it can uh, competition is essentially good. Um, so yeah. I think that the ANC does need competition. And um, I think that the young people of this country who are waking up and challenging it, um, are, are going to present it with competition in the, in the next few years. You know, you, you're actually giving me goosebumps. I don't know my dad and my granddad how they would feel. When I say goosebumps, it, it's, uh, it's the first time I hear from the ANC it being spoken so directly, you know? Um, which then is going to elevate my next question. In other words, most of us, in fact, the minute we consider even reading the manifesto of another uh, party, we already feel like we're betraying the ANC. And I think it's a very important uh, point that you have made to say the membership of the ANC today 
is not the same as the membership of the ANC, you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Um, we would actually be surprised uh, if we were to look inside the membership to find that there are a lot of people there that um, don't necessarily resonate with um, the ideology of the ANC, at least from us outside looking in, which then raises an even uh, higher question, Chris. What then is the relevance of political parties in terms of the problems that we still uh, find? Do we then still need to have that thinking that says the best vehicle to solve the problems of today is a political vehicle? Why is it not a technology company or a social entrepreneurship type of a company or another form of association? You know, uh, we've got people in here that are part of investment clubs, uh, those sort of things. Could we not then say going forward, as far as we are fighting now an economic uh, struggle, you know, some of the things that I'm looking at here, interest rate hikes, load shading, unemployment, the shutting down of big business and small business. I mean, actually, that those are very economic uh, issues. Um, mm -hmm when you look at that, and I'm sure when I read the papers of the ANC as far back as your liver tumbles and them, they were more concerned about the struggle of taking political power. And I don't expect to see in the, I don't even expect to see BEE in those, in those papers. You know, we all know famously, it's a hidden secret that BEE very closely coincided with negotiations. It, it, it surprised even some of the members of the ANC. Um, as an economic blind spot that they had back then. Are political parties then the best vehicle to take forward to solve the problems that we have listed on here? Mm. Um, okay, before I answer, I must clarify, of course, I'm, as you had said, I am speaking in my personal capacity, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I would say that, um, okay, we are in a situation firstly where we, we deal with what we have. So in order to change that, um, I think it would be a very, very difficult, because um, now you're going to change essentially the entire the political system. Um, it would be, it would be a, a very difficult uh, thing for us to do in South Africa. And in order to even change the, the, the political system or the constitution, you'd need a party that has, uh, I, I believe it's two thirds majority or so. Um, so I think that it's, it's, it's very, Oh, what you are proposing or what you are suggesting yeah. or alluding to, um, yeah. I have thought about myself, um, but, but I think but, it would be very difficult. Yeah, However, but, I, I would agree. Yeah. yeah so, I would agree that, okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. No, you may go ahead. Oh, I, I would say that I think the bigger challenge would, given our current system is, pro, is, is, is more so that we need to professionalize um, government and politics. I think that that is essentially what is probably more lacking in, in government and in the movement. I think a more, a more autocratic approach to it, um, a more professional approach to it would do us uh, a lot of good. Um, I think in, two, I mean, how, how many years, roughly 30 years of democracy, I think uh, maybe we should reconsider things like CADA deployment, um, and, and, and so on. But um, I think in order to address our immediate issues, um, it, would, it, would be, it would serve us better if we focused more on professionalizing it because it, it, would, it, it would be a very difficult change to shift from political parties and, 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 and political organizations to it being other forms of institutions. So you're saying fixing the political parties we have is still the best route that we currently uh, that is currently available to us. Um, I, either that or the the presentation of a new uh, political organization that is more again professional or 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 um, you know autocratic that that yeah more autocratic. The 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 issue here is that the political organizations that we have have too many career politicians yeah. instead of having professionals who who have capacity in particular fields you know where you can say hey comrade chris you have expertise in this field you have 20 years 
um, we understand we have 20, 30 years of experience, for instance, or you're young and you have some experience, um, we want to put you there in, in this particular place where which coincides with your profession. Um, yeah. But and in in the in the current in the current uh, uh, situation, you can take Comrade Chris and you can make him the Minister of Justice, and he knows nothing about law. Yeah. You yeah. Know, so I was, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, I was so actually I, about to clarify that for the gallery. Um, when you say career politicians, I mean, for example, I'm almost the same age as Malema, and I don't understand what qualification he has um to better represent the economic struggle that i don't have mm -hmm. however the challenge that i face if i were to try and solve the problems of this country is that as a career politician the mic will be given to him and not to me uh, to mm -hmm. give um, suggestions as to how to fix for example interest rate hikes or unemployment mm -hmm. uh, Am I catching you correctly in that regard? No, you that is exactly that is yeah. exactly what I'm 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 highlighting. Yeah. And in fact, to just to add on to that, I think that one of the other problems is that as as a professional, for instance, you don't yeah. have the time to be on the ground for you know being playing the career politics. You know, um, always yeah. be at, at these places. For instance, if there's a strike, you know, there's yeah. a strike at nine o'clock. Maybe you have to be at work at a particular bank. Yeah. You know, so the people who yeah. are really who really have the time to be politically active on the ground in most cases uh, are people who are either unemployed unless they're employed in government or politics. Um, yeah. But it's, in, it's individuals who are unemployed or who are who are working in a political space already. So these are the individuals who have the time to rise up the ranks in those sorts of environments and 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 so on, whereas those who are professionals and <laughs> gaining the experience, gaining the, the credentials that are going to be required to lead the country forward, those people are not active in politics because A, they don't have the time, uh, uh, B, they are now just so desensitized to it that they are not interested in, in being involved. So we are faced with that challenge, uh, even, even yeah. us ourselves who try to balance it. Um, yeah. You know, there are times when I, I, I simply can't be there because I must be at work, you know? Yeah. So, mm, yeah, I think I, so I don't see how it's it's going to change because the nature of politics in SA is 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 essentially that that the person who is the career politician gets a lot more recognition than the individual yeah. who is is building business who actually has tangible experience in building a company. You know. Do you do you think it's fair or I would be too harsh if I said then us professionals are lazy or complacent because I'll take, for example, the door-to-door -door campaigns that the ANC does better than any political party. While, you know, we are complaining on uh, Twitter and your Facebooks that, you know, the ANC is down and out. When it's election time, everybody in the ANC understands they need to roll up their sleeves and knock on a door and sit with Ugogo and take down what their issue is. And, you know, at my most despondent, actually, that was when it hit me that actually the ANC deserves to be running this country. Because if I've got an economic solution for our people, and the only means that I'm trying to uh, reach them is through WhatsApp, Twitter, Facebook, where the majority of them are not, I then deserve the outcomes that I'm getting. Because mm. the, and this is where when we say that you know, even 30 years later, we can still complain about apartheid. One of the successes of apartheid, and I think people confuse that as well. People confuse the fact that apartheid ended with it being a failure. Apartheid was a success. And one of its successes was this divide and conquer, putting myself here in Gauteng, laboring away, putting my parents and grandparents in a smaller town and then a rural area um, such that I can't leverage that link or that uh, generational knowledge or generational wealth or generational access. Such that if I come up with an economic solution to problems that exist, I have to go there if I want to roll it out. And me as a professional, not doing that will 
abdicate, the, I, will leave, I will leave that vacuum where these solutions will continue to be solved by politics because the politics or the political parties or the political arena understands that if you want to be relevant in politics, you have to build your distribution channel to go on each and, and knock on each door. I remember one particular year at the DA uh, held what looked like a very successful um, pol uh, political campaign when they were doing the stages. I think they had gone the US route to say, let's have these huge uh, stages and uh, performances. And then they still went on to lose. I think they got one of the metros or they got to share Pretoria. That was the first year that that happened. I think around 2014 or 2016, if I can remember. But what I still was impressed by is that the ANC still didn't drop below, I think they didn't drop below 60% at that point in time. And that's when you realize that as a young professional, if you're a lawyer, a doctor, a nurse, what have you, and you are afraid to start a practice because more and more, we are moving into the arena where we say, start your own businesses. That's the only way that you're going to get a meaningful leg. You're not going to get a promotion to senior management in white corporate South Africa. If you are afraid to do that, and the reason you're afraid to do that is because you don't think you're going to get customers. Okay. First of all, if you are doing it in Gauteng, you are correct. You are not going to get customers. You're not going to do it from the comfort of your address. You know, you're not going to put a big uh, sign outside of your mid-rent apartment, and then patients are gonna come and see you there. The people of this country are in the townships. The people of this country are in the rural areas. And if you want to have a thriving uh, business in those regards, you have to go there, you know? You cannot just put up a post on Facebook and expect that they will come to you in mid-rent. And if they don't uh, use your services, online, then there's no market for your services. Um, yeah, mm. I think that's that. Mm. <laughs> that being said- if I, if I could comment on that, yeah. I think, okay. Yes. I, no, I, I, was just, I was just going to say, sure, that um, I think also the black middle class needs to take responsibility for yeah. um, one, you know, we are now in spaces or we're able to be in spaces that are a bit more, comfortable um yeah. where now all of a sudden Gunzima for me to go back to like you said Ilali Asakai or my my homeland where my parents grew up or you know uh, to go back there and start a business or to leave the comfort of Gauteng and Johannesburg to go back to the Eastern Cape and be in in that environment I think um that is one of the, the problems because what we are essentially having and just at a smaller scale is in our local small communities, our townships and so on, um, we're getting an exodus of skills. So Chris Uzahamba, Ayofunde Vets, he graduates and all of that, and then he stays that side. Those skills, they don't come back to the community and benefit the local community, you see? Yeah. So I think that a part of the problem of what you are saying um, is, is not just, for instance, starting your own practice and starting a business as much, that is a big part of the problem, but also the skills that we gain. These skills and, and, and this experience can actually help build our communities, but not, none of us yeah. want to actually make the sacrifice and go back uh, and, yeah. and, and do that. So, so I think that that is a part, a part of the challenge. I think we need to somehow incentivize um, um, the middle class or new graduates and so on to take their skills home and 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 try and build the the local economy there yeah and and i want to be fair to them you know um you know if i grew up in makaya and that's what i know i most likely would look for work there and if i'm unemployed there that is where i will say you know there are no jobs if i grew up a goalie uh, that is where I'm comfortable. That is where I would look for work. And that is where I'll complain uh, that there are no jobs. Um, I want to semi-cross over into a bit of the guilt. And you'll hear that I'm touching on a bit of everything just so that our mm. wide problems get an opportunity to be aired, but also our defenses in that regard. I know in finance, one of the common ones that um, I used to be a proponent of up until I realized actually that's not necessarily 
the problem I think it is. I used to lament that, um, you know, when young people uh, then start climbing the corporate ladder and they're buying the Mercedes Benzes and their houses here um, in Cape Town, in uh, Joburg, as the two centers of power, uh, economic power at least, you know that that is the money that should be getting used to build our township uh, economies as well as to build our rural areas, mm. right? But there's still the reality of the human condition, the reality that as a human being, when you reach certain, certain milestones, you do want to see certain things or certain assets uh, manifest around you, number one. But number two, you do want to see that where you are, you know, most of us in our lifetimes move within one inch. The thing that South Africa may be unique in is that by the time you make a success of yourself as a professional, you've actually made a big career move compared to a, a thing. Um, our English and African counterparts, most of the time, you can become an accountant having, having never left your small space. To what extent is it fair? to try and put an expectation on the money that young professionals are now earning to mm. uplift the economic situation that we find ourselves in. Is it fair to say to a young lady, a young gent, don't buy a five series, three series, rather buy a Polo Vivo and then with the extra money, take it back, uh, Emma Kaya? Uh. <laughs> No, I don't believe that it is fair. But um, having said that, I don't believe that the world is fair. Um, I think we must we have to accept the reality that we are the first generation that can really, you know, enter these spaces and uh, try and reverse some of the challenges of the past. Now we yeah. want to live. We are comparing our lives to people who admittedly have generational wealth, the, you know, our, our Caucasian counterparts and so on. Um, you, you know, uh, 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 Chris cannot uh, be at the same level of work, earning the same amount of money and, and expect to be at the same level as the white person. Only in an idealistic world would that happen. But the reality is that um, I'm not being bought a flat or a, an apartment, you know, I'm not being bought my first car, you know. So, so I'm not in the same position as much as um, I, may, I, I may long for it. The reality is that there has to be a generation that is going to make the sacrifice to get us mm -hmm. Uh, closer to the, the situation, because like you alluded to earlier on, we have political uh, freedom, but we don't have economic freedom. We are behind them. And um, I don't believe that, um, I don't believe that a black person, the black people um, as a whole, I don't believe that we, are, we can prosper without accepting that first and making uh, the necessary sacrifices and saying, Ish, maybe I must hold off in, instead of buying this Benz, maybe I must uh, start with this in Dozokala and I can buy the Benz in 10 years. You know, um, I, I think it, it, it is an unfair expectation, but it is uh, a reality of our situation if we are trying to liberate Black people economically. Can you perhaps give me the script 10 years down the line, 15 years down the line, if we don't do that? So mm. I decide that, hey, Chris, I hear you. Hey, I am for it. Let me skip mm. it, you know. Let's move mm. on. Mm. Uh, I've seen, I see many of, especially your cadres, um, or your former cadres, they seem to be fine. They are here in Sentin, they are here in, um, in Midrand, whatever. They are driving my dream car. Mm. They didn't do it. Yes. Uh, there's more that we can do, but ah, why can't I kick the can, the can down the road as well? Mm. At which point does it fall apart? Mm. Well, firstly, I must I must um, what I must uh, express my own discontent with these very cadres you're speaking of. Um, yeah. uh, I mean, for obvious reasons, uh, I don't believe that a public servant or, or, or should be. Um, living an opulent lifestyle. That is not why you are in public service. And so they are a part of the problem. 
um, firstly, we must acknowledge that these are not, as I had said, that they are, there are different types of comrades, right? There are good ones, there are bad ones, there are people who are here with ill intentions. And, and so if somebody but, is, is... But but is it not expecting too much from a career politician, uh, Chris? Because to your earlier point, this person, when I decided in first year to study accounting, they decided I'm going to study... Uh, political sciences or whatever qualification it takes to mm. climb that hierarchy. And now, as a public servant, they now feel the same way. For example, um, I work for the famous auditing company um, that audits the public books. Mm. I don't, I, I'm a, I, I feel I'm a public servant, but every month when I take my paycheck home and the decisions that, um, that uh, I have to make on my paycheck, I decide those in my personal capacity, you know? Mm. I have served the public, and now when I get home as an auditor who has earned his income, I will buy my iPhone, you know? Mm. I don't need to be using a telecom SIM card just because I audit for that public company. Mm. Are they not justified in saying uh, the same? Uh, I, I know. I, I believe that... Um, the calling to public service, firstly, it should be a calling. Um, yeah. You have to see it as, and again, I maybe perhaps I am idealistic, but um, I believe that if you are a public servant, then you, you've reconciled the fact that um, what you are doing is you're doing it for the country, you're doing it to better the lives of other people. It's not, yes, we want forward mobility in life. Um, that is a natural yeah. thing, uh, but Opulence. There's a difference between excessive, um, uh, excessive amounts of of money or or, or, or chowing, <laughs> and yeah. and living a decent and living a decent life. So, I I just I don't believe that a public servant should be rich, um, and I think that the, that the misconception of people in the in the private sector, I I, I look at them completely different. But uh, the public sector, I I believe that. Um, individuals there should be there for completely different reasons. And those reasons have to be um, reflected in their actions. There is no reason why some of these politicians have as much money as they have. Um, uh, I mean, they don't even pay for you know, housing and so on and so forth. So uh, why are they stealing so much money? Why are they um, uh, or even why do they why why are they why do they have so many businesses? I I believe that for the duration of your stint in public service. So if you give them ten years, for instance, then over the period of that ten years, you must make the sacrifice of not have living an opulent life. Um, the moment that you leave public service, then that is fine. But um, for the duration of you being a public servant, I believe that you should not be. Um, driving on my C63s and so on. Can, can, can I dispel one notion mm. though? I don't mm. think South Africa truly has a private sector. In fact, mm. I can even go as far as to say globally, the world, um, in order for them to convince some of us that there truly is a private sector, uh, in other words, neatly so, um, mm. it's going to be a long stretch because I think what is a hidden secret as well is that the public, the private sector of today is the same people that were doing business with government yesterday, even today for that matter. Mm -hmm. So even them, it's government money that they're spending. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, I've had the privilege of um, traveling around the country and sleeping at some of the country lodges and uh, proteas and what have you. And without fail, the biggest clients are government departments. Mm. Such that if I bump into the Unaya Country Lodge, I will think that this is a very successful um, private sector individual, mm. not realizing that, no, he's the other transaction of a government transaction. Mm. Um, including even if we go to your Apples and your Facebooks, we often give a lot of credit to your Steve Jobs and your Mark Zuckerbergs for having built uh, good, clean, innovative uh, businesses forgetting that their biggest clients are the American military in some instances, mm. especially for the hardware and the advanced hardware. But over and above the American military, America, for example, is built on very strong 
um, public infrastructure as far as the data cables and the fiber cables that were laid out some 50 to 100 years ago. Mm. Though coming to, I just want to merge those two just so that uh, we be a bit careful, um, but also to continue the theme and to create the relevance to the young professionals that think that perhaps their wealth has going to is going to do nothing has, is going to have nothing to do with government mm. to say that actually when it comes to any country for that matter the biggest consumer is the government mm. you know and what sometimes we fail to also distinguish about government procurement you know when we say a tender that is government procuring a service on behalf of the public mm. so that accounting service that uh, clinical service, that legal service that Umama cannot afford to pay herself. Government has said, actually, we will issue a tender and register your law firm with us so that you can still go and service Umama, Ekaya, Emakaya, E Lalin, wherever, and we will pay the price, we will pay the bill. So to her, it's a free service. But actually, it's not a free service. Government is 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 a uh, thing, is footing the bill uh, on the other side. Mbali says, yeah, I think we need to find a way to hold the government more accountable for their function. What does that mean, um, Chris? Who are we holding accountable? Because democracy says the people shall govern, and we are the people. Parliament is a representation of us, the people, and those that have read further will know that in Libya, for example, they have more a system of what they used to call a direct democracy. So they don't have a parliament system like we have in South Africa. They've got a wide system like we have in electing our political parties. So in Libya, instead of sitting in a parliament, it ends at a wide level. And the inputs that our current wards take to the mother body, to the DA, to the ANC, you name it, in Libya, those views then come to cabinet instead of going to parliament. And the reason that's the case is because as we have as we experience in South Africa, you have a situation where government is made up of the DA, the EFF, COPE, the one CDA COPE, the UDM, the IFP, the ANC. But when citizens experience frustration, according to them, it's the ANC that's letting them down not realizing that actually it's also the EFF that's letting you down, it's the DA that's letting you down. It's the representative type of uh, system, political system that we have that is letting us down. And a clear example of that, for example, is when fights occur in parliament, inside parliament, or for example, when in parliament they want to question the president about now the money that is under his mattress, previously with Zuma, it was the money, I mean, that built in Kandla, and with Tabombeki, it was the HIV and ARV scandal. What you will pick up, and some of us pick up as a common thread, is that we will have our goals and objectives as citizens. And then what happens because of the representative system that we have in South Africa, when those representatives of us, the people, get to parliament, they will then be distracted by a 250 million rand young, young Kandla. By all measures, 250 million rand is nothing, you know? If you think that it's a lot of money, then I don't think you are ready to see the trillions that we are actually responsible for as a government. And as a result, you know, for the, every time there's a debate on Nkandla or the money that's under the president's uh, mattress, I don't care, you know? Yes, it is breaking the law and the president should be held to account. It's straightforward, take it to court and then keep parliament talking about the main issues that affect the majority of South Africa. Discussing the president's six million rands or dollars is not going to change the situation as it is for the majority of the country. And one of the reasons that is the case, and I think that's what enables this career, uh, career uh, polit uh, 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 politicians or makes politics a career. How do you hold government accountable in that regard? And what does it mean to hold government more accountable? 
You are muted there. Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I lost you for a second. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I I believe that 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 is a challenge now. Um, yeah, a challenge that I think the the movement. I'll speak from the perspective of the the ANC now. That within yeah. the ANC, that is something that um, I think we are we're commonly faced with. Ideally, what is supposed to happen is that um, these representatives, because um, these representatives are sent or deployed by the, the organization, you see, now they're supposed to answer to the organization based on, for example, what they're doing there. Are they doing what the organization has sent them to do? Now, I think the, the real issue is that who they are supposed to be answering to is themselves. You have somebody who is in a position that is supposed in a position of authority in the ANC, right? Who is supposed to be making sure that the people in government are doing government work. But that very same person who is, for instance, the chairperson of the ANC is now the mayor of the of the of the of the what do you call this of the metro, you see. So he, he's answering to himself. You see, yeah. uh, you have, I mean, the senior guys in the NEC are going to go and be ministers. So it's, it, there's no accountability within the organization first, which is truthfully more powerful, I believe, than the actual people. Um, the people vote for the ANC, but the people don't vote for the individuals who go into government. Uh, the yeah. ANC votes for those people, you see. Yeah. So we can sit here and, I, I de- I, and idolize and say that um, we've, these people are representing us as, as ordinary citizens, but the reality of the political system is that these people are representing those who voted for them in the ANC. You, okay. you, 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 you yeah, are I get you. So, yeah. so the, the challenge is, in, yeah. is the ANC holding itself accountable. So it's, it's like when Bobby said to us, Kesa Chiefs fans, that this is a family business. You are not shareholders <laughs> here. Essentially, <laughs> it's the same. Where... And unfortunately, that is the structure of our political system. Um, yeah. When uh, you know, not to digress too much, but during my honors, my honors year, I did a, a thesis. I did a study on whether or not we need to reform the political system because, yeah. in its current form, it doesn't give power to the actual citizen. Uh, the only thing that you yeah. do, for it's instance, good. you can vote for the ANC because you believe in its policies, right, and in, in, in its yeah. ideals and its principles. Um, but you may not believe in the individuals who are at the helm of it to go and implement it, right? Yeah. So how do you reconcile those two differences where I believe in what the ANC says it's going to do, but I don't believe yeah. Chris is going to go and do it. I would rather yeah. have someone else do it, you see? So um, I think that the challenge is in that, that um, the, the people who are being put in place um, yeah. whether they're the wrong or the right people, they, they don't account to anyone but themselves. Yeah. They so how then, know. how then, Chris, do we hold government accountable as things stand? So let's mm. forget the reform. It's not going to happen. Mm. Um, I've seen a lot of suggestions. If we just do this, if we just do that, the reality is that as things stand, mm. uh, Bobby Mutawung is at the helm. Uh, mm to use it as, a, as, as an analogy, you know, mm. uh, the Mandelas and the Khadebes are in charge, right? Mm. Um, and the rest of us are just supporters. We are mm. not part of the family business. Mm. How then do we hold case chiefs accountable? How do we hold the ANC mm. accountable? Well, we, we as fans have to stop buying tickets. Okay. Um, you, you, you get what I'm saying. Well, you you yeah, understand it's my, very clear. what I mean by it. Yes, it's very clear. Uh, I think I think, um, I think people in power, people yeah. in power only um, really take things seriously when there is a threat of losing that power. And let me yeah. clarify: as I said, I'm I'm still an ANC member. I still yeah. believe in what the ANC should be. You understand? Yeah. But I do believe that um, a bit more accountability from the voting population. Uh, uh, would would do the ANC good because I believe that firstly the refref would leave if the ANC started was losing a bit of power you know a bit of influence there are not enough government job um, postings and political postings for these people these people will start to disappear first and foremost Um, I, I, I so and I just think in terms of being a 
a, a fan of democracy, you know? Yeah. Um, I believe that it's a healthier democracy where there, there are challenges to the ANC in power. So um, as a loyal ANC member, I, be, I see that no, in, its car in the current situation, we're too arrogant, um, we have too much, we're too dominant. Um, and I think that the young people of today um, whether they're active or not, I think that those young people are, are, are they're hard for, you know, they're, yeah. they're, they're done with it. Um, and they're going to show us in this election that ANC is probably going to um, lose a large number of, uh, you know, I don't think that we're going to perform as well as we think. I think we might, there's a chance of us even getting into a coalition perhaps in the next election. But um, I, I mean, the, the power is, is, is diminishing. And yeah. I think that that's the only way to do it. Two, two questions. Um, and I think you've been very consistent, actually, in the point that you made earlier. I think now the problem or the challenge is on us. We, we keep being in denial of what we're hearing. Or we hear it, but I think because it's the first time we hear it, we can't believe that's what you are saying. Mm. You are directly saying that. There is no, there is there is no way to hold the ANC accountable except to threaten the incentives that they have, and the incentives yes. that they have, the legitimacy they, that that they currently have, is that we elect them as a party. We say that we like Kaiser Chiefs to be a soccer club that continues to make fifty million rands a year. Then. Because it's a family business, they then have the prerogative or the mandate to decide what operational changes to enforce in order to run this business of theirs. The rest of us, all we do is we, is we, we give it legitimacy. But outside of that, we don't have a say. We mm. have an influence, but that influence is once every four years. I can't even say striking anymore because South Africa has become, uh, the political parties have become immune to strikes. Striking no longer uh, mm. uh, influences uh, political decisions, you know. Mm. You'll strike for service delivery and that very same mayor will plant even more resources in mm. that uh, striking, uh, uh, what do you call it, um, city or council or municipality. So I think it's very clear, you've made it very clear. And when we say the ANC, it's the same for the EFF. When you elect the EFF, you are just going to elect Orlando Pirates to be in charge or mm. Chipa United to be in charge. Mm. You are not changing South Africa. You are just changing who's at the top of the log. You mm. know? Precisely, precisely. Precisely. And, and, and mm. yeah. And mm. the danger with then not recognizing that is that you might think, let's put Mami Lodi Sundowns in charge because they've got a track record of winning games, which is the mm. DA. They have a track record for governing. Mm. Not realizing that even the DA itself, uh, one political commentator indicated that the reason he still believes the DA is not a viable option, besides the fact that um, they've managed to kick out all the black leaders that got them their votes, and the, and the Musi has gone on to do interviews and explain that actually the DA started having a, a problem with him when he wanted mm. to implement uh, what he felt was necessary for um, Black South Africans to actually enjoy the fruits of democracy. Mm. And this commentator said the challenge with electing the DA is that you're going to legitimize them as the governing party. And the same way you don't have control over what the ANC does, you will not have control over what the DA does. And mm. where the DA has got where the DA governs, even there they have demonstrated that they've got no interest in creating black millionaires or mm. black, a successful black middle class. Our brothers and sisters that live in Cape Town, they live on the outskirts of Cape Town. They live in Belleville, they, they take the metro rail as if they are not you know, in first class professions of accounting and law and what have you, you will not find a black person in the city center uh, that lives there, what have you. Um, again, <laughs> it, it leaves me saying still, what then says that the political vehicle 
is the relevant vehicle of the 21st century, you know, except that it is the current vehicle in place. You know, mm. if you are interested in watching football, local football, the place to do it, unfortunately, is to watch the PSL, irrespective of how many games in a row uh, Sundowns wins or loses. If you want to watch sports, sports in this country is football and football and football and football, you know. Mm. A career question for our professionals here. How do you work for the ANC? How do you apply for a job within the ANC and then uh, pursue your capitalist agenda inside there? Is it solely through a political ticket? Oh, are you, are you, ask, are you asking me? <laughs> I'm asking you. <laughs> um, Can I be the accountant of the ANC at Lutuli House? <laughs> or do I have to be a cadre mm. in good standing and then yeah. uh, I believe I can so. Then, yeah. Yeah. I believe that you I believe that you have to be a member of the ANC. The reason why they do this is because but I'm not, I'm not entirely sure. But what I will say yeah. is that the professionals who I do know within the organization are all members of the ANC or they become yeah. members once they are offered the, the job. The and job. I think that the reason that they do this is, is more of a, you must remember that um, there's an element of um, trust you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, you for instance, you can't come and be a, the accountant of the ANC and then you were sent there by the DA, you see. Yeah. So, yeah. so they essentially try and ensure that you are a member of, of, of the organization if you're going to do work for the organization. Um, I think that that is shame. That is, that is a logical approach to it, uh, particularly because it's a political organization. Yeah. Chris, um, in closing, I'm going to uh, propose an alternative. Um, I'm first going to read um, Bali's uh, comment. Sure. And then propose an alternative. I wanted us at least um, to do the 15 minutes uh, that we lost at the beginning justice. It's not that we went over time. Mm. Um, if you guys have got commitments, then at least you know that you're not missing out on anything. But also, even to be fair to you guys, uh, Chris, you do have lives uh, that you lead outside um, uh, these, these dialogues. Mbali says, while I believe that so much can be achieved by the public or residents of a community, are we not exonerating the government of their duties by placing this responsibility on the public? Bearing in mind that the community members rarely have the money to afford daily needs, while the government has budgeted funds for these basic service delivery issues. Um, in that regard, I'll venture and answer, and Chris, you can respond to me in that, uh, to the extent that you're more um, qualified to answer. For me, as far as I'm concerned, when it comes to government, right? First of all, government as we see it, i.e. government being the ANC, right? This is essentially, um, we're in sub-Saharan Africa, the poorest part of the poorest continent on earth. We are essentially in the jungle. And any semblance of institution or formality, I think is somewhat of a facade. It's more, the, the reality that we more live or that we live is that the informal sector, the informal sector and informality is sustaining us as a country, right? Um, I have the privilege of knowing that Mbali is a lawyer, so I know she's not going to be happy if I, I, if I accept that when we do have a, form, a formal mechanisms. But I, as an accountant, we first deal with the substance, and then we'll deal with the form, the legal form that we have it. In substance, I think we really are being carried by the informal sector, by informality, by, um, by a secondary type of layer of government, of citizenry and citizenship. I don't think the average South African has got a high enough appreciation of the three spheres of, spheres of governing, government such that they can 100% have an, an entitlement towards the government. As I say, the entitlement is to the ANC and it's to the ANC as they understood it during the struggle, you know? That is on the substance uh, side as things okay. It gets even worse 
and you really you will note that even I myself, I was, I was today years old when I realized that the extent to which politics has become careerized is at the level where the ANC I have in mind, the ANC membership I have in mind looks completely different to the ANC membership that exists today. The ANC members of today are the same age as my dad, who is 53 and has made his living through whatever profession he chose. The ANC has equally got a 53 year old who is there and believes that they are there to feed their family the same way that my dad wakes up and goes to work. That is how they experience the ANC. Mm. Any idea of there being a higher calling is to exactly to the same extent that my dad experiences a higher calling. You know, he grew up wanting to be a, in my case, an accountant. And as a result, every time I practice accounting, I feel as if I'm, pre I'm, I'm, I'm extending a public duty. But there is no member of the public that can come into my house and say the chair that I have is too expensive for a public official, you know? That is the, that is the, uh, 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 what do you call it? The substance of the political systems that we have currently. Right. And in form, I think I touched on it a bit, but in form, even then, it is a lot more like that, you know? Um, we are faced with an organization. We have decided that what's going to run this country is political organizations. We easily could have said it's asset managers, then coronation would have been in charge of the country. It just so happens that we decided that it is political parties. Mm. And as things stand, the political party that is in charge and any other for that matter, they do not have a, comp a, 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 a complaint line that the public can use. Such mm. that the only way that Currently, we can hold the government or the political parties accountable is to vote for an alternative party. Because I can't even say it's to abstain from voting, voting. Because when you abstain from voting, if they, we have a thousand citizens and only a hundred go vote, mm -hmm. currently the constitution says that hundred is the one that's going to determine who's, who's the political party of the day, despite the fact that they're in the minority, you know? Mm -hmm. It's the majority of voters that are going to select the government of the day. And if it happens that less than 500 voters are voting, then that is who is going to de uh, uh, decide who is, uh, thing, who is running the country. In, mm -hmm. And it's similar with our corporates. Remember, every day that you spend a rand, you are voting for the type of South Africa that you want to see. If you have a policy with Old Mutual versus with Nkomu Capital, you are saying that I want to see Old Mutual continue to be a finance institution that exists in this country, and Nkomo Capital should not. That is a vote that you are that you are exercising, and to the extent that they um, market each other or market themselves, they will then get that vote. And that is what we see every day when politicians post on Twitter or they make themselves to appear to be the solution to your problems. They are just marketing. They are just saying to you that when it comes time to buy a product, four years time, buy this product. Mm. I want to close on the alternative, uh, Mr. Mpel. And that's to propose, and again, without absolving, exonerating government of their duties, maybe as a parallel or maybe as a long-term realistic alternative to say, it's fine, continue to tell chiefs which player to put in. But in the meantime, if you like soccer, start your own football club, you know, mm. or start appreciating soccer at a different level to the, to the one that you currently enjoy. Maybe watch high school soccer or something like that. What do I mean? As a citizen, and this is something that I'm firmly trying to believe, to build or to establish. I'm trying to establish a community of solution oriented young professionals who are going to do what they did in Orania, actually, now that we've got a living uh, embodiment of it, who are going to say that we acknowledge that we live, we exist within the context of 
a government and politics and what have you. But for example, we are all going to buy our plots in this particular area. We are then going to service it with a lot of private services. So we'll drill our own water, we'll build our own schools, we'll drive our own cars or we'll walk for as long as we are not able to manufacture cars. And to the extent that we eventually get to a level where we are able to manufacture cars, then we will manufacture the cars and we'll drive our own cars. We will be the minority within the bigger scheme of South Africa, but at least we will know that our problems start and end with us, at least as far as survival is concerned. Because as you can see, the list of problems that we have put on screen, there is no area of our lives now that is no longer affected. Every area, even the areas of former competence are no longer competent. You know, you go to Woolies, you get rotten uh, fruits and vegetables at Woolies. Um, you go to Kuro, you go to wherever the academic standard of the education is being questioned, you name it. Such that what we are left with is the model that I saw now in the last four or five years, uh, five months, in Guiani, in Venda, in the greater Limpopo area, where they happily are living a life in the economy that they live in, you know? There's one McDonald's, I remember seeing, I think one Sasol, then the rest it's global uh, garages and the takeaways, um, what's, the, what's, uh, what's the name of that um, chicken franchise in Venda? Monati Chicken. You know, that's the biggest franchise that I saw in Venda. And according to the standard of life that I'm used to here in Gauteng, obviously it's a decrease in standard of living. But according to the social agreement that they have with one another, it seems as if for them that works for them and it circulates money around there. They've got their own accountants, they've got their own doctors, They've got no poverty as far as I could see. You know, every household has got 15 trees, study mango, little avocado, such that they sell those uh, to Gauteng at a fraction of the price. And the reason I do that is because this chaos is descending. These conversations are conversations that are happening while the Titanic is sinking. It is a very long way until the Titanic turns around and faces up. So if you can foresee or forecast that we are, we are going to crash anyway, we, we long past the point at which if the correct interventions come in, they can save us. If the correct interventions come in now, they are going to mitigate the impact of the crash, but we are still going to crash. What is most likely going to happen? is that as South Africans, we are going to need to learn how to build a country from scratch. We are going to learn how to generate electricity from darkness. We are going to learn how to manufacture candles, how to pour water again, how to grow through food, how to pave a road, how to build a house before the situation changes in the country. It's not a prerequisite that those things happen before the situation in the country happens. The United States, Britain can be kind to us and decide that they're going to buy our gold at um, much fairer and much nicer prices, uh, give us loans or forgive our loans, and we avert that situation. But as a practical survival tool, as far as your own individual agency, accept mm. that that is what is going to happen in your mm. personal life. Mm. And if you avert that, then at least you are vetted. It's like when we say have savings, us in mm. finance, when we say save for a rainy day, the rainy day may not come. But in the event that it comes, it finds you better having a, 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 a that fund uh, mm. over there. If you don't have that fund and your only solution or your only hope is that you will continue to be employed, the government will somehow get in a guilty conscience and run the country appropriately. The rest of Africa has got, good, has got bad news for you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we were the last country to gain democracy. What's happening here is not new. It's yeah. not unprecedented. It has happened 51 times 
in uh, the 54, 52 African countries that we do have. Mm. It just feels new to us because it's the lens, it's our lens that we are seeing it through. And if we don't learn to survive from grassroots, we are going to find ourselves educated doctors migrating to England and growing our own food in the backyards and accepting menial jobs there, you know? Mm. And that is not a gloom uh, thing to say. It's gloom because obviously I'm concluding mm. and my tone is going down <laughs> and we still enjoy some semblance of electricity. But mm. from what I've seen in Venda, it's the most liberating thing uh, on earth because no matter what happens in greater South Africa, you know that you have started to mitigate what's the worst that can happen to me and my family. And mm -hmm. as they have it in Venda, what's the worst that can happen to me, my family, and my community? Currently, mm -hmm. if South Africa goes to the ground, Venda will still enjoy um, mm -hmm. hotels, dams, uh, festivals. They now have mm -hmm. got award-winning artists. Quality of life for Venda is going to be materially higher than quality of life in the Eastern Cape or the Northwest or those types of uh, those parts, uh, mm. provinces. Mm. Yeah, Can I just I comment on that? I, on, you on you that, may. That, you may. Um, I, I believe that they did something similar in the States at some point. Um, I, I can't remember the name of the place, but it was a Black place where Blacks bought... In the I same think it's Black Wall Street in Tolkien. Black Wall Street, yes. It was Black burned Street, down. So. It was burned yes. down. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I believe you're speaking of the same model, right? And yeah. and um I've heard of what's going on in Venda. I have I, I unfortunately I've not experienced it myself. I have not seen it, but I would agree with you that um even if you have a positive image of the country, I would agree with you that that is an approach that that one should take, and even more so that. Um, you should try and free yourself as much from the influence of government in the sense that, you know, you must have solar, you must have a borehole, um, you know, you, you, you essentially try and get off the grid as much as possible. Um, because as much as I have hope for the country, um, my, your assessment of the future of the country is one that um, I, I must say I share, um, that it, it's, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Um, so. In terms of your alternative, um, as an individual, I would agree that the, that that approach would would work. Um, and it's not something that you can do alone, like you said. We must agree as young people or as people uh, uh, who perhaps have a bit more than others that okay, um, this area called uh, I don't know uh, Deep Slot. This is where we're doing this. We're gonna buy. Uh, land in this place and we're all going to come and do this there um but again it, 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 we're going to need to convince people of this yeah um i'm a fan of just do it you know um but i don't want to put pressure on myself and create commitments and then tomorrow you see me in my bands and you think <laughs> ah, Mara, this guy that's the same guy that was saying this um, but I think at my most extreme, and I think I'm close to that right now, you'll just hear me one day saying, or you'll just see the background in the Zoom call that, hey, this Kada is sitting somewhere uh, in, in, in the Savannah in this country, where I'll just take one or two of my friends mm -hmm. and we'll just buy a plot somewhere and the two of us will live there and, you know, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't think it will happen 50 at a time or 100 at a time or whatever. I think it will happen two people at a time, then three, then four, then mm. eight, then 16. And I think I want to close on that note that you mentioned of, of uh, buying, uh, going solar, what have you. And I think as we negotiate with our professionals to say, we are not saying don't buy your bands, rather go and invest at home. That is the ideal in this situation. Mm the situation is so bad or so dire, we are now saying, instead of buying your bands, actually first buy a Jojo tank, first buy a solar panel and an inverter, mm. and then buy your bands, mm. just so that at least you yourself can mm. survive um, the current times that we are going through. And we are going in it, you know? Mm. I will keep on re reiterating that to any young professionals that we're meeting. It's not doom and gloom. It's mm. an investor's honest assessment to say, mm. we are going into darkness 
load shedding is not getting solved. We are actually going, we are, we are being given time to see how we survive with four hours of electricity, six hours of electricity. There will come a time when there is no electricity. And now is the time that you should have moved yourself off the grid. And the same is for water, the same is for whatever. You know, if next year, December, well, 2023 now, if by 2023, December, we each have our uh, 1,000 liters or 10,000 liters Jojo tank, and we have an inverter, and maybe half a solar panel, nah, this conversation of how to hold government accountable will be a lot more effective because now we're not arguing out of desperation. Now we are arguing from a strong place to say, you know what, if the lights are going to switch off, I'll be fine. But I want you to fix this. You know, it's like when you complain in a restaurant, if you complain not having any money, you are very humble complaining. But if you've got the money, you let them know that this is unacceptable. Take it back. Give me another plate uh, of food. Mr. Christopher, thank you very much. I think. No, thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, yeah, um, you had the dialogue that I was hoping for. I was very worried that it would have. Um, uh, disintegrated into a very cadre like uh, dialogue. And I know I don't have to qualify it such uh, is the state of how things have occurred over the last 10, 15, 20 years that you even know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But I appreciate it. I especially appreciate the fact that you guys are still in the party and you still engage. Um, as I posted uh, after Lindo posted the status, you know, I posted that what I respect about Lindo and I respect about yourselves and others like you, whether I do or don't join you later, is that the men in the arena, you know, nobody can say anything about the men in the arena, you know. Us that are standing by the sidelines complaining about uh, this and that, unfortunately, it's just that we're on the sidelines. But where you have absolved me is to say, I can be, a, I can feel less guilty thinking that the ANC is our solution and actually accept that the ANC may well be our best political solution, but maybe now we don't need a political solution, we need an economic solution and maybe start aligning with those uh, institutions that perhaps are better positioned uh, to deliver that economic solution. Uh, and perhaps even social, because I know, I sadly, we never got to touch on issues of GBV, um, as well as the disappearing and the weakening of men. It's, it's actually quite interesting that on the right or on the left, um, depending on, I forget which one is the politically correct one, mm. you've got a situation where our sisters are crying desperately, which, you know, stop hating us, um, you know. And on the left, our men have been erased to invisibility you know, mm. and the, some of our solutions lie from having strong men, um, mm. you know, no matter how, how much we can try and run away uh, from that. And those are some of the other issues that I wish uh, we could have touched on. Um, mm. But as I say, the best that we have done in this sitting is to, to acknowledge and identify that perhaps the political vehicles are not the best to take us forward. Mm. The, they are the best given the current dispensation, but they are going to do what politicians now are going to do, you know. Mm, agreed, yeah. fully agreed. May I, may I just say in closing that I, I, I agree with you that um, we, there's a lot, there's a multitude of issues that um, we need to address, um, but yeah. this is not the last. <laughs> this yeah. is not the last sitting that we'll be having. So we can, we can park them for, for a later stage if you will have me again. <laughs> yeah. No, and we may even have one of our other uh, guests uh, today. Uh, as this is a dialogue, it's not monopolized by me or you. Mm, you know, of course. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you very much, uh, Chris. And I think you'll extend my gratitude to Lindo as well um, okay. for his outburst, his public outburst. And thank you, everybody <laughs> that uh, joined us. Um, yeah, I hope it was value for your time. Thank you for having me. All right. Cheers, everyone.